Descartes project in the meditations is to find new foundations for human knowledge, foundations that are certain and indubitable. And so foundations upon which we can build uh, the structure of human knowledge that will be stable and likely to last so that we don't wind up in the same situation that we did uh, when we adhered to the Aristotelian paradigm. And that situation was one in which we had to basically throw out everything we believed. We had to throw out all of human knowledge up to that point. We had to start over. And so there were 1800 years of scientific investigation and inquiry that was in vain because it ended up being built on garbage on this teleological view of the world and so on. So Descartes is trying to find these foundations for science, for, new, for human knowledge that are certain, that couldn't possibly be false. And his proposed way of doing this is to call into doubt everything that could be doubted. So, any, so his proposed way of doing this is to examine all of his beliefs and to eliminate from consideration any belief that can be doubted. Right. And then the idea is the only beliefs that will be left after we've eliminated everything that can be doubted, um, the only beliefs that are going to be left are the certain, indubitable, undoubtable beliefs. And then those beliefs can serve as the foundation. That's how we'll find these <clears throat> foundational uh, beliefs for the new science for human knowledge. But what Descartes very quickly notes is that I can't go through my beliefs one by one. That would take forever. I would never get through them all. If I just went through every single belief I had trying to see if I could doubt it, well, that I would, I would never finish. Um, right? If I, you know, I believe that my car is out in the driveway. Can I doubt that? Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess I could because someone could have stolen it. Okay. So that's doubtable. I believe that my, whatever, my sofa is down in the living room. Could I doubt? Well, yeah, that same guy could have put the sofa in the car and then driven away with it. He could have stolen that too. Right. If I went through every single, I would, it would just take forever. And so Descartes is not going to go through every single belief that he has trying to see if he see if it could be false, see if there's any reason for doubting it. Rather, and again, just to be clear, when he raises these reasons for doubt, he's not trying to get us to actually believe that someone stole your car or your sofa or whatever. Right. The fact that someone could have stolen my car is a reason to doubt that my car is in the driveway right now. My car is still probably in the driveway right now. He's not saying you should believe your car is not in the driveway. He's saying merely that, well, look, it's doubtable. It could be the case that it's not. I'm not saying, you know, that you should believe that someone stole your car. I'm just saying I'm trying to draw attention to the fact that it's not absolutely certain. Right. And the fact that you can doubt it is a sign that it's not absolutely certain. OK, so instead of going through our beliefs one by one, which would take forever and never finish it, Descartes proposes to do the following. I'm going to give some general kind of uh, uh, scenarios which would cause us to doubt a whole host of beliefs that we have. Right. So these kind of general skeptical scenarios. And his idea is what he's going to do is he's going to work up to successively stronger skeptical scenarios or skeptical hypotheses. And there are three of these. They get stronger as we proceed. So the first skeptical hypothesis calls into doubt a lot of beliefs, but a kind of limited set. The second skeptical hypothesis is going to call into doubt everything that the first hypothesis calls into doubt, but then also more. And then the third hypo skeptical hypothesis calls into doubt everything that could possibly be called into doubt, according to Descartes, right? So it's a kind of universal skeptical hypothesis. And so anything that survives that third skeptical hypothesis is going to be indubitable and certain. Now, why does he build up in this way? I think part of the reason is he's just kind of, um, um, he's trying to be careful, right? 
but he's also trying to lead the reader along, right? We'll start off with something that's kind of more familiar and we'll work our way up. <clears throat> um, he's trying to undermine more generally the faith that we might have in our senses because in Descartes' view, most people base most of their beliefs on their senses, on perception. And according to Descartes, that is not a good foundation for human knowledge because just about everything that comes to us, yeah, everything that comes to us from the senses is doubtable. Okay, so let's see how this works. Incidentally, I should also say, so I'm calling them the three skeptical hypotheses. I might also call them the stages of doubt, the stages of doubt, the three skeptical hypotheses. Those are the same thing. And so he runs through these in um, the first meditation. <clears throat> the first thing he mentions that he points out, he says, look, sometimes the senses deceive us. Sometimes your senses tell you one thing, right? And it really seems to you to be true, but it's false. And so what he... Um, the example, the illustration that he gives, which is not all that compelling, but whatever, I'll give a more compelling example in just a second. The example he gives is of uh, uh, looking at a tower that's really far away. And so let's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, rec, it's a square tower. Yeah, it's got four walls. It's a square. Its footprint is a square. But you're really far away from it and say there's a fog too and, and whatever right and you look at it and it looks to you for all the world like it's cylindrical like it's round and so you're looking at it and your senses your eyes are telling you that's a round tower in the dis in the distance but as you get closer you see oh no gee wow ugh. eyes what good are eyes it's actually square right? So your eyes, your senses there have deceived you. They told you this, the, the tower was cylindrical, was round, but it's actually not round. It's a square or whatever, right? That's Descartes' example. And the upshot of this, <clears throat> what this calls into doubt is perception in unfavorable conditions, right? When you're really far away from the tower and there's a fog. Well, in, if you're in a situation like that, yeah, you have reason for doubting what your eyes are telling you. Or uh, to give uh, an example using a different sense, let's say um, you're in a room and there's a lot of noise in the room. There's a, I don't know, there's a band playing, everybody's talking or something like that. And you think you hear something. You think you hear someone call out your name or, or something like that, right? That happens. But nobody actually did because whatever, it was just, it didn't actually happen. You thought you, well, that's unfavorable conditions for hearing, right? When it's really loud and it's all confusing or whatever, right? That's, uh, and so you're in a situation like that. Yeah, maybe it's wise to doubt that somebody actually said your name. You're really far away from the tower. It's wise to doubt that the tower is actually there, or at least it's doubtable that the tower is actually there. It's doubtable that somebody said your name. But if you're in a room and there's no band and it's perfect, right? And somebody says, hey, and, you know, and says your name. Well, there's, you know, the fact that in a noisy room, it might appear that someone has said your name when no one has that fact doesn't give you any reason for doubting that when you're in a quiet room with just one other person and they say your name right you don't have any reason for doubting that they actually said your name likewise the fact that when you're far away from a tower and there's a fog you know maybe it's not you know you might be deceived about the shape of it that fact doesn't give you any reason for doubting that when you're right up next to the tower that you that your eyes are telling you that it's true shape a better example of what he's getting at here are uh, optical illusions. So here's one. Look at this, <clears throat> uh, this figure, well, I don't know what you call this, this picture, there we go. Squares A and B, yeah? Are squares A and B the same shade of gray or are they different? And I think just, you know, I mean, you can already, 
maybe tell where this is going, but your eyes for all the world, you look at that, your eyes tell you they are different shades of gray. A is darker, it's a darker shade of gray than B. Look at it all you like, your eyes tell you that. But A and B are actually the same shade of gray. Right? When you eliminate the rest of the picture, you can see that. Do it again, right? There's no trick. I'm not actually making B darker as this goes around. I'm just eliminating the rest of the picture. A and B are actually the same shade of gray. And so when the full picture is there, what is going on is your eyes are deceiving you. A and B in that picture are the exact same shade of gray, and yet your eyes are telling you that they're different. <clears throat> okay, one more time, I guess, right? It took a while to make this. So we may as well do it and, you know, get our, get our money's worth here. Okay, right? Okay. A and B are actually the same shade of gray. And so that's just getting at the very same point. And there's a million kinds of these optical illusions out there, right? That you can go look around on the internet and find. And so look, the senses deceive us, right? Your eyes are telling you they're the same shade of gray. They're not. Don't believe your senses. Well, fine. In those kinds of unfavorable conditions, don't believe you know your senses. When you're far away from the tower, when you're in a room with a lot of noise, or when somebody has deliberately designed a picture to trick your eyes, when somebody has deliberately designed an optical illusion, well, yeah, in those kinds of situations, don't believe what your senses tell you. It's, you know, what your senses are telling you is doubtable, might not be true. Fine, fair enough. But look, if I'm not looking at an optical illusion, and if there isn't a fog, and if it's not really noisy, there's not a band playing, you haven't given me any reason to doubt what my senses tell me then. And so Descartes moves on to a stronger hypothesis. The first skeptical hypothesis only calls into doubt our perceptions in unfavorable conditions, where unfavorable conditions are like being really far away, there's a fog, there's a lot of noise, it's a optical illusion deliberately designed to trick your senses, right? In those situations, sure, doubt your perceptions. But Descartes thinks we can doubt more than just that. And so he moves on to a stronger hypothesis, which I'm going to call the dream hypothesis for reasons which are obvious. Descartes says uh, something like the following. Imagine right now that you are actually dreaming. Well, if that were the case, right, then when you're looking at your screen right now, you're not actually looking at a screen. There's no screen in front of you. Why? Well, because what's in front of you right now is, I don't know, nothing, right? You're laying in your bed, and if you were to open your eyes, you just see the ceiling or something. There's no screen right there. If you're dreaming right now, then all the things that you think you're perceiving, you're not actually perceiving. You think that um, uh, whatever, that you're watching a video on a screen. You're not. You're not actually doing that. You think your hand is, you know, you know, touch your face right now, right? You think your hand is touching your face. It's not, right? Your hand is actually under your pillow or, or whatever. And so the dream, this dream hypothesis, the fact that we might actually be dreaming right now, it seems to call a lot of things into doubt, right? That you have, that you're looking at a hand right now. If you look at your hand, that you're looking at that. Nope, not true. That's false if you're dreaming right now. You're not actually looking at your hand. And so the dream hypothesis seems to call into doubt perception even under favorable conditions. Say you're dreaming about this tower across the field and it looks to you round or whatever, but then you get closer and you see that it's square. Well, the first skeptical hypothesis doesn't call into doubt that there's a square tower right there. The second skeptical hypothesis calls into doubt that there's a square tower right there. That's Descartes' idea. And so this dream hypothesis is a much stronger skeptical hypothesis. And if you were to say something like, 
you know, so what are some replies that you might make? Somebody might say something like, well, look, I know I'm not dreaming right now because um, uh, what are some of the things that people say? Like you can't read in dreams, I think is, I don't know if that's actually true, but I think uh, maybe some psychologists, whatever, say things like that. You can't actually read in dreams or you can't read numbers or, or whatever, certain stuff like that. Well, okay, fine. Maybe most of your dreams you can't read. Maybe this is the first dream in which you can read. Maybe those dreams in which you can't read are simply dreams within your dream, right? And maybe, right, within this dream, you can read. Well, somebody might then come back and say, look, um, my dreams aren't continuous. So I fall asleep, I have a dream, I wake up. And then when I fall asleep again the next night, it's not as though my dream picks up where my last night's dream left off, right? My dreams aren't continuous. They're just different. Whereas what's going on right now, this is continuous. I'm doing what I'm doing right now. And, uh, you know, I, I picked up where I left off when I went to sleep last night. There's this kind of continuous experience. Descartes could simply say, however, well, that doesn't prove you're not in a dream right now, because maybe this is the first continuous dream you've ever had. Maybe this is the first continuous dream in which you can read that you've ever had. Right. And so these kinds of signs are no signs that you're not dreaming right now. Descartes not trying to convince you that you actually are dreaming right now. He's trying to say, look, for all you know, you could be dreaming. And if that's true, then everything you perceive around you is actually false. It's a reason to doubt what you're perceiving. He's not trying to convince you that you're not actually looking at a screen right now. He's saying, look, it's doubtable that you're actually looking at a screen right now because you might just be dreaming. Okay, so that looks like a pretty strong skeptical hypothesis. But look, the title of the thing says three, and we're only on two. So what's wrong with that? That's not strong enough, according to Descartes. It's not. Because the dream hypothesis does not call into doubt perception of the, what I'm going to call, building blocks of our dreams. This gets a little uh, complicated, kind of sophisticated, nuanced. The idea is something like this. If you're dreaming right now, <clears throat> well, then what's happening? Let's say you're looking at your hand, okay? If you're dreaming that right now, what's happening is your mind is putting together various ideas that it's kind of stocked with, and it's producing this mental image of a hand. That's what your dream is. It's your mind producing these mental images. And so if you're looking at your hand right now, your mind is taking uh, certain colors, the colors that you see in your hand there, certain shapes, the shapes that you see in your hand there and whatever, and certain other ideas that you have, like something's being extended, taking up space and so on. And it's putting a bunch of these ideas together and creating this mental image of a hand. And in general, that's what your dreams are, right? And so you're dreaming that you're looking at a green blade of grass while your mind has taken the, the idea of green and smashed, smashed it together with this idea of a, a particular kind of shape, you know, the blade shape or whatever, and produce that mental image, right? Descartes' idea is that our dreams are formed up out of these basic ideas, ideas of shapes, of colors, and so on. And he gives a whole list of these kind of basic building blocks. The dream hypothesis does not call into doubt that at some point in the past, we actually perceived those things. You actually perceived green. You actually perceived a triangle. You actually perceived a circle, a sphere, and so on. You actually perceived things that take up space that are extended. The dream hypothesis, in fact, seems to require that at some point in the past, you actually perceived these things. And so you got some true information from your senses, namely 
this information about greenness or triangularity or whatever, right? And so it might be the case now that your mind is just taking those building blocks that you had gotten sometime earlier from perception. It's just taking those building blocks and arranging them in particular ways to produce your dream images, right? So it calls into doubt that there's actually a green triangle before you, but it doesn't call into doubt that at some point in the past, you actually perceived greenness. And that's where you got this building block from. And Descartes, so that's a very small uh, set of beliefs. But nonetheless, Descartes thinks even those beliefs can be doubted. There's reason to doubt even those beliefs. Uh, those perceptions are perceptions of these building blocks at some point or another. There's reason to doubt even those. And the dream hypothesis doesn't call that into doubt. So we need to move to something even stronger. And that is this third skeptical hypothesis, the deceiving God hypothesis. Descartes says, imagine this. Imagine that... Well, you know, so it goes something like this. I've got this, so here's how Descartes thinking. I've got this idea of God in my mind, right? And he would want to say, look, everybody has this. I'm not saying God actually exists or anything like that. I'm just saying, look, everybody, even an atheist has an idea of God. They just don't think God actually exists, right? There's something that they're denying. They're denying that this thing, God, exists. Well, in order to do that, you got to have an idea of God, right? No. Okay, so look, everybody's got this idea of God. <clears throat> this is going to be important later on. Well, uh, whatever. Don't worry about it now. Everyone's got this idea of God. Okay, fine. And that idea is of a being that is totally powerful. That's one of the things that we see in that idea. Okay. Well, imagine that there were a totally powerful God who was evil, who wanted to deceive us at every single opportunity, wanted to deceive us about everything. That's the deceiving God hypothesis. Imagine there's this omnipotent, all-powerful being whose sole purpose is to deceive us about everything that we could possibly be deceived about. This hypothesis, again, he's not saying there actually is such a thing or whatever. He's not trying to convince us that there actually is such a thing. What he's saying is that this is going to call everything into doubt. And so in his view, this calls into doubt. Sure, absolutely. If you're far away from a tower and there's a fog, yeah, it calls into doubt that, that, you know, that the thing is actually round. It calls into doubt um, what the dream hypothesis calls into doubt too. Because if there were a deceiving God and you're looking at your hand right now, well, that's just a mental image placed there by God. There's not a, by this evil God. There's not actually a hand in front of you. But it also calls into doubt that you ever perceived these building blocks, that any of your perceptions have ever been reliable because it's all just God tricking you. All, everything. Your mind isn't creating these images. Everything that comes before your mind is placed there by this deceiving God to deceive you. And so it's even... Uh, uh, calls into doubt even more than the dream hypothesis. It calls into doubt that you've ever perceived these building blocks. And so it, co it calls into doubt all perception. Every last thing about perception is called into doubt by the deceiving God hypothesis. But then Descartes notes something further. It goes even, it calls into doubt not only all perception, but even all mathematics, all mathematical truths. So you might think to yourself, um, okay, fine. All perception called into doubt by the Stephen God hypothesis. Okay, fine, fine, fine. What about something like two plus two equals four? Right? What Descartes says is the Stephen God hypothesis calls into doubt even those things that seem most certain to us, like two plus two equals four. Right? When you think about that, there's just no way that could be false, right? I mean, you just have this feeling of certainty. Two plus two equals four. Yeah, how could, you know, it's not like, yeah, maybe someone robbed your car and maybe you're dreaming. So the hands are now right there right now. But two plus two equals four. That just, I don't see any way that that could be false. But what Descartes notes is this. Look, 
Maybe what's actually going on is that when you think two plus two equals four, this deceiving God is implanting in you this feeling of utter certainty. And maybe two plus two actually and in truth equals five. Maybe that's the truth of it. And that when we think two plus two equals five, and we think there's no way that's true, uh, no way two plus two equals five, right? When we think that, that's just the deceiving God deceiving us. Maybe it's actually the case that two plus two equals five, and the deceiving God is planting this feeling of absolute unbelievability into us when we consider two plus two equals five. And when we consider two plus two equals four, he implants this feeling of absolute certainty, even though it doesn't, even though it's false, right? And so the deceiving God hypothesis not only calls into doubt all perception, but also these truths that seem to us most certain. So for in, in the primary example would be mathematical truths. It calls even those into doubt. And so at this point, and this brings us to the end of the first meditation, right? It seems like just everything is called into doubt. How could anything possibly escape the deceiving God hypothesis? How could there be any belief that the deceiving God hypothesis doesn't call into doubt? Descartes thinks there is a belief that it doesn't call into doubt. And he's going to use this belief to, to establish these foundations for human knowledge. And we'll see what this belief is in the second meditation. <laughs>